Uh, and the first thing I want to do is uh, tell you that uh, you're part of an experiment this morning. Uh, you may have noticed the camera in the back corner. I hope you all wore your makeup and your best outfits this morning. Um, we are going to videotape this session, and uh, it's going to be replayed on next Wednesday morning at uh, 10.30. And we did that originally uh, to accommodate uh, the speaker's schedule, but uh, it's also an experiment because it's something we've been talking about doing anyway because you have so many uh, choices during this two weeks that we're trying to find a way to maybe uh, offer some of the more interesting sessions uh, uh, a second time or in the evening or something. And so this is uh, an experiment. But in any event, if you did have trouble this morning deciding where to go, I wanted to tell you that you will have a second shot at watching the videotape of this and seeing how your friends perform in the question and answer session uh, next Wednesday morning at, uh, at 1030. Our speaker this morning is Peter Bradford, who uh, is just back from Hungary, and so there may be a little bit of uh, uh, jet lag. Peter is a consultant on utility regulation, restructuring, and energy policy in the U.S. and abroad. He is a lawyer with uh, his degree from Yale. He is currently affiliated with the Regulatory Assistance Project, uh, the, environmental, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, and many foundations to provide assistance to state and federal commissions regarding energy policy and environmental protection. Uh, he has advised on utility restructuring issues in Indonesia, India, Russia, and Armenia. And some of you who have been around for uh, a few years may remember that Peter also served for several years as chairman of the New York State uh, Public Utilities Commission, and before that, chairman of the Maine uh, Public Service Commission, and also served uh, uh, for a time at the uh, U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And he's also an author and uh, has had articles published, in addition to a book that he had published, had articles published uh, on regulation and uh, energy-related issues in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the L.A. Times, the Boston Globe, Newsday, and the Electricity Journal. With that introduction, I'm very pleased to welcome this morning Peter Bradford. Peter, welcome. And do I dare go near that? And, uh, or do I turn that off? Well, just a minute here. Gee, our taping isn't going very well here, is it? I'm not sure how to turn it off. Can you turn? Okay. This is not ready for prime time, is it? <laughs> that sounded promising. Yeah. Nope. This one seems to know. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Actually, that wasn't me. <laughs> the uh, first time that I came to this program, I'm embarrassed to say, um, was 23 years ago. Uh, and the tension was between sitting through the sessions and slipping out to watch the House Judiciary Committee impeachment hearings. Uh, with regard to uh, the, it was the next to last year of the, the Nixon presidency. Um, in recollecting that, uh, I realized how remote it seemed in those days that there would ever be occasion to talk about mergers as uh, a topic at this program. Um, there had not been, at that time, an electric industry merger of any real consequence for a couple of decades, I would think. And there wasn't to be one for another 15 years or so. Um, it's uh, nonetheless a topic now that is uh, really seems to be accelerating. There hard, hardly a two-week period goes by in which there isn't another 
significant merger or, or convergence announced. And what I want to focus on particularly this morning are ideas for getting the public's interest uh, to the forefront in the formulation and in the evaluation of mergers. Um, I want to talk also somewhat about the specific issues that arise, of course, when regulators have to evaluate mergers, the standards they use, the criteria that they apply. But I'm particularly concerned that the wave of mergers that we're seeing now, almost without exception, have been shaped by private parties to meet the ends that uh, uh, they see as, as paramount. And because these are very large transactions, because they become important to an awful lot of people uh, in, the, in the private companies, by the time they hit the regulatory agenda, uh, there's a very substantial amount of momentum behind them, a constant decrying of any uh, prospect of delay, a great deal of political backing and forthing. Uh, and the leeway that the commission, that public sector parties, that uh, consumer advocates offices, that environmentalists may have to advance issues that are of great public significance is already considerably circumscribed by the fact that uh, the uh, the train is moving very rapidly down the tracks, and they're starting really more than halfway through a process that's likely to have been going on for a couple of years already. Um, so the area that I'm most anxious to focus on is how to shift that equation somewhat in order to be sure that the concerns that the public may have receive a somewhat uh, receive a great deal more attention early in the process of putting mergers together and what techniques you as regulators and regulatory staff can use to make that happen. Um, I come at this without, with, without any strong negative predisposition toward mergers as such. Uh, their history in the regulated utility industry and, and uh, particularly in the electric industry, is a very mixed one. They've been an engine for substantial improvement in the electric industry in its early years in terms of its economic efficiency and its technological advancement. They've also been the engine by which the industry got itself into its first great era of public discontent, the second being the nuclear construction era of the 1970s. But the first was the holding company uh, overreaching and those substantial, very substantial financial collapses in the 1920s, which really followed directly upon an era of mergers and consolidations as to which state regulation had not been up to the task of uh, effectively protecting not only the public's interest really, but the investors' interests either. Uh, and federal regulation had at that time been altogether non-existent. Indeed, one of the significant reforms in the wake of the uh, failed mergers in the 1920s was the, uh, uh, of course, the passage of the Public Utility Holding Company Act and the substantial stre strengthening of the powers of both the then Federal Power Commission and the Securities and Exchange Commission to review the structures of the utility industry. So we're talking about something. Uh, we're talking about uh, a set of events that has the potential to do a lot of good things for customers um, if it's channeled sensibly. but we'd be foolish looking back at this history not to understand also that it has the potential to do a great deal of harm. Uh, and that's reflected in, let's see, I don't, are, uh, is the outline that I put together, has been distributed to you, the two quotes that are uh, 
on the first page of it from Alfred Kahn and uh, from John Chenefield and Irwin Stelzer reflect both both sides of the uh, uh, the merger equation. As it happens, uh, Fred Kahn's quote was written in his book, which came out in 1972, whereas the Stelzer Chenefield book just came out a couple of years ago. Um, but the perspective is is very similar. Uh, the other uh, point to keep in mind is that we shouldn't be surprised at the utility interest in merging now. Uh, this type of activity has been characteristic of every one of the uh, regulated industries into which substantial competition has been introduced, uh, into which substantial deregulation seems to be occurring, and specifically into which risk is shifting from customers to investors. Uh, because I think we have to recognize of shortcomings of, of regulation in years, a lot of inefficiency in, has been in each of the regulated industries, including the electric industry. And nobody knows that better than the industry's own managers. Uh, so that as they look around and see the prospect of an environment in which uh, that inefficiency has the potential to get them into a great deal of trouble, mergers and combinations, for good reasons and bad, have a lot of appeal to them as a potential defensive response. And I think once we understand that, and once we understand the extent to which similar behavior occurred, for example, in the airline industry in the 1980s, the trucking industry uh, during that era as well, to a lesser but not trivial degree now in the telephone industry also, we know that this isn't a passing phenomenon. Uh, there's no reason to think that the, the pace of merger and consolidation in the electric power industry is going to slow down anytime soon. Uh, and uh, so all of you who are going to be working on these issues in state regulatory commissions have at least this area as a response to those in the state legislature who say, well, with, de with deregulation and competition, we don't need uh, the regulators anymore. I think mergers is going to be a, a growth sector for some time to come. Um, but there's an urgency in adjusting to that because since mergers have not been an issue that state commissions have had to worry about. Indeed, the entire area of protection of competitive markets has not been an area that state commissions have had to worry about for, uh, for many years. The tools that the states can use, uh, the techniques, the perspectives, the people, the skills, uh, tend not to be in place in most state agencies now. The processes that state commissions have in place are geared to quite a different type of proceeding uh, and to, one, to proceedings with well understood traditions and paths to them into which merger evaluation doesn't necessarily fit very comfortably. So one of the uh, corollaries of this wave of, of merger activities is the need for state regulators uh, to be asking themselves not only what processes they can be using to get out of the reactive mode that uh, puts them so far behind the eight ball by the time the merger comes in the door, but also what types of changes to the regulatory agency itself, statutory possibly, enforcement possibly, training possibly, uh, hiring policies possibly, are appropriate by way of response to uh, this wave of activity that's, that's going to be forthcoming. Um, I should have indicated incidentally at the outset that I uh, get awfully tired of the sound of my own voice sometime after about the twelfth minute. So to the extent that I say anything that anyone wants to react to and, and uh, uh, either ask a question or start a discussion around, um, I would consider that a, a great favor and uh, would encourage you to do it. Um, 
the current pace of uh, merger announcements, as I indicated, seems to be running at about two a month. And they're not just electric utilities merging with electric utilities. It's uh, electric and gas, um, electric and independent power producers, IPPs with each other, uh, international, uh, at least purchasing, if not merging, uh, is very much underway. Um, and I think it's almost inevitable. Yes? There's a, I wouldn't say that they're driven by you know, a, a gas a gas fired generation nexus. Uh, Enron, uh, for example, out in, in Oregon, I don't know the percentage of gas fired generation there, but I'd be surprised to find that, that it was uh, significant. Um, Brooklyn Union and Lilco, uh, Lilco's gas fire generation has been on the rise, but that's not really uh, what that merger is about either. Lilco has gas properties of its own on Long Island that Brooklyn Union has been uh, interested in for a decade, even without the, uh, the electric properties. Um, they're, they're the, by and large, that area area of mergers seems to me less troublesome than electric with electric or, or gas with gas, except for the area, except for the, the extent that it may dampen competition between gas and electric as a uh, um, meaningful method of giving customers choices among, choices between aggressive marketers of, of different fuels in the future. In, uh, in New York, where all of the major electric companies are combined companies already, that is combination gas and electric companies, uh, but where a couple of the gas companies are not combination, National Fuel and Brooklyn Union, it was very clear uh, that the standalone gas companies were much more aggressive, much more innovative as marketers of gas. Uh, than the gas divisions of the combination gas and electric companies. And there were a couple of reasons for that, not all of which I think are likely to carry forward into the future. For example, the electric companies in New York coming out of the late 1980s had, with two exceptions, Con Ed and uh, Orange and Rockland, all been involved in very difficult nuclear construction experiences that had shifted top management attention substantially away from gas. And indeed, at least in Loco's case, there was reason to think that they didn't really want their gas growth in their gas section taking away their electric load. Um, so uh, they had very sleepy gas divisions. And, uh, it's, uh, and, and in part because of an interest in the senior management in not having the gas undercutting the, the projections that have been used to justify the completion of the nuclear plants. So it, uh, it's, it is an area of, of, of potential worry, but I don't think uh, those worries center primarily around gas, the, the predominance of gas-fired generation. In fact, in most areas of the country, still, I'd be surprised to find that gas made up uh, even the plural, plural, plurality share of, uh, the, of, of, of a utilities generation mix. I think uh, it's still, uh, gas is certainly the fastest growing sector, but I think it, it's, it's still com the combinations of, of the other fuels uh, still keep it down to a, a fairly low percentage. The, uh, the rate of growth in, and focus on mergers, of course, is also 
one of the factors contributing to interest in changing uh, the federal laws that were passed uh, some years ago, especially the Holding Company Act. And the argument is that now that competition is very much part of the mixture in which the mergers are taking place, the protections in the Holding Company Act aren't as necessary as they were in the time when the mergers were taking place in a, in a purely monopoly environment. Um, FERC has, uh, of course, is the, the leading recipient of the, the wave of mergers because they have to review almost all of them, whereas each state commission only has to review the ones within its borders. Uh, and FERC had been operating under a merger policy that had been fundamentally unchanged since it was adopted in the early 1960s, uh, which focused on uh, a combination of customer impacts and competitive market impacts and some concern also over uh, the regulatory framework. This was the so-called Commonwealth Edison test. Uh, but in December of last year, FERC shifted its uh, uh, the merger policy focus quite substantially in the direction of protecting competitive markets. Uh, and this was in its merger policy statement of last December. Uh, and FERC indicated that its analysis, while it still had a fundamental concern with, with customer impacts uh, in it, would focus much more heavily on a sequence in which they would be looking first at whether the merger would increase concentration in uh, any markets of concern to them. Um, secondly, whether that increased concentration would have derogatory effects on competition. And then at what the potentials uh, for mitigation uh, through various measures, um, divestiture, for example, ISO creation, entry of other uh, competitors um, would be, and then at some of the plus sides of the merger, whether there would be efficiency gain, what the consequences might be for either of the companies going forward with the merger. Um, it's pretty early still to forecast exactly what this shift in stand in terms portends in terms of the kinds of decisions FERC will be making, especially because FERC itself is in some flux right now. Uh, clearly, the, the change in FERC's merger standards, I think, is a step in a, in a sensible direction. The old standards were not geared to anything like uh, present day realities, and also had been applied in ways that take some of the costs and overstate some of the benefits. That in a couple of minutes when I talk some more about the uh, the state review processes, because some of the flaws in the FERC process uh, underlie the, the evaluation of mergers in, uh, in some state proceedings as well under the general public interest mandate that most states apply to merger approval decisions now. But one thing that seems pretty clearly to have emerged as a result of FERC's recent decisions and I don't mean that FERC's recent decisions has caused this problem so much as that it's revealed uh, the problem, is a continuing set of jurisdictional difficulties. And of course, as state regulators, you know there are always going to be jurisdictional issues with FERC. Uh, in this case, because FERC has actually been quite deferential to state jurisdictional claims with regard to retail markets, um, it appears as though there's at least potential void as to protection of the competitive marketplace because FERC is confining its attention to the wholesale markets uh, on the basis that it really doesn't have jurisdiction, um, or at least that it prefers to defer jurisdiction over retail competition to the states, since the states are the ones with the power to order retail competition. And in at least some cases, and I'm thinking particularly now of the Baltimore Gas and Electric uh, PEPCO case, the two affected state commissions, D.C. and Maryland, both petitioned FERC to leave, leave the retail 
evaluation to them, saying they were prepared to protect competition in the retail markets. And then Maryland, uh, at least in its decision, really didn't pay much detailed attention to the structure of the retail competitive marketplace. Now, the Maryland decision was pretty strong on some of the ratepayer benefit issues with the result that the merger is now very much in question. The D.C. Commission has yet to issue a decision, so it's not clear what uh, uh, to expect from them with regard to retail competition. But there does seem to be this, uh, this void in which the state, not having much experience with acting as a pro-competition, uh, competition police, if you will, tend to focus pretty heavily on customer. Will there be a rate freeze? Will there be rate reductions? Uh, uh, what's going to happen to the company headquarters? What's going to happen to the, um, those kinds of more traditional state concerns? And a lot of the protection of, of the marketplace, which may be where much of the long-term benefit of restructuring is at least up for grabs. FERC has said they, won't, they really can't do it, and it remains to be seen whether many states are going to uh, seize that challenge. Um, the uh, state criteria, yes. Uh, let's see, we're, he we're headed waters anyway. Let me, uh, 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 at least deal with a part of it up front. The states, it will depend on the statute that the commission operates under initially. That is, if they have to decide a merger today. At the end, I'm going to be advocating to you reviewed with just that question in mind to be sure that you have the full range of traditional antitrust remedies. Um, but potentially, at least, a state could attempt a merger approval, whatever types of conditions were necessary to uh, prevent the kinds of market concentration, market po power to set prices by a dominant seller, uh, that, for example, um, in divestiture, some generating asset. It looked as though nation concentrative in a genuinely ISO. Uh, um, the construction, if necessary, of facilities to alleviate sort of pockets of market power that sometimes come up when transmission uh, or even conceivably distribution is inadequate to allow customers to have meaning. Uh, it, it becomes important though, to think about the, the merger filing requirements, to think about the end of policy statement, and now I really am getting ahead of myself, but what the hell. Uh, the uh, uh, kinds of things that you can do in order to make clear where the market power difficulties are, so that you're not at the end of the merger review, let's say you have six months to do it, uh, and five months and ten days have gone by, and the commission is trying to figure out still what the impacts on market power might be. The parties have all thrown in uh, books of evidence, learned economists have, have, have testified, but there's really no, sort of, no very clear assessment, and the commission in its last three weeks is trying to work its way through to some sensible set of conditions. Better, I would think, to have had something like the National Environmental Policy Act's requirement for an impact statement, only in this case a competitive impact statement, uh, as part of the filing requirements for a mer to have had a commission policy statement go out uh, and eventually be adopted even before any mergers were on the horizon, um, indicating that mitigation of uh, anti-competitive impacts was expected as discussion of and, of and miti mitigation of uh, as part of the, uh, the filing. For that matter, for those of you who are in consumer advocates' offices, uh, 
I suppose you could petition the commission to go down that road, or you could indicate, as the Department of Justice does through its merger guidelines, what the price of the Consumer Advocates Office support might be in advance. That is, the kinds of things you would expect a merger filing to address. I would guess that a, a wise utility might then actually consult with the office uh, as part of putting this together. But at the, even, if, even if, for reasons of, of financial confidentiality, that didn't take place, at the very least, they couldn't, uh, three or four months into the filing, start belaboring requests for information as being too late in the game and, and uh, uh, contributing to the delay of this project that's so crucial to the economic future of the state. Um, so the, my answer to your question has a couple of levels. One, procedurally, think through how to identify the potential harms. Um, review the statutes to be sure that the commission has the, the uh, full arsenal of antitrust remedies. The chances are, if it's a traditional PUC statute, the commission doesn't have anything like that explicitly in the statute. What it will have is a statement uh, that basically sets up a public interest standard for the review of mergers. And if it seeks to condition merger approval on something other than traditional rate-setting grounds, there's at least the potential for a court challenge uh, that the commission, well, you know the drill, the commission is trying to do through conditions what it doesn't have the power to do directly uh, through an order. And you know, some states, some state courts will cut the commission some slack in that regard. There's a case we'll talk about later in Maine where the, uh, the court really uh, pulled the commission pretty far back from trying to reach out in that direction at all. Yes? I, I, I didn't mean to say they hadn't addressed it. It just was not, it turned out not to be as high on their list as their filing with FERC suggested uh, that it would have been. Uh, well, here's the dilemma. I, in theory, yes. Uh, and in fact, you can even write a merger approval order that expressly reserves all your powers to do all the things that you might have done uh, on the day that you approved the merger, only really three, three years later you're saying you're going to do them. Uh, and. You then get into, I mean, there are a couple of different roads that open up at that point. And Maryland's actually gone down one of them, although not for this reason, in which the uh, merger applicants then say, well, we can't go forward under a cloud like this. We need a clearer uh, statement of what the, what the rules will be. Um, and so then the, uh, the, it kind of falls back on the commission to make a decision at the beginning. But let's say that doesn't happen. Let's say that. Uh, after, uh, after conducting its competition review proceeding, it takes a couple of years, uh, the commission concludes that after all divestiture uh, of uh, some generating plant is required and issues an order uh, to that effect. Uh, now, is it saying at that point that if the utilities refuse to divest, the merger falls apart again and that the two applicants have to be recreated whole, that the new corporate headquarters has to be torn down, all of the fired vice presidents have to be rehired. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't, uh, it doesn't really compute that you're preserving um, the power to, to disallow the merger uh, retroactively out, out uh, into the future. Now, you can 
try to get around that by saying that the approval of the merger is conditioned on a written statement from the applicants that they will comply with whatever conditions are necessary. Uh, and so you won't have to take the merger apart because basically they'll say, they're saying they'll do anything. But I don't know that they would sign uh, something of that sort. And also, it seems to me if, you're going, if you then find yourself in court two years after the fact, um, trying to enforce what was ostensibly a merger approval condition, uh, that if the court is one that's inclined to be skeptical of the commission reaching beyond its direct statutory powers, uh, the balance is going to tip somewhat against the commission if you're that far removed in time from the merger uh, decision itself. That it, even though ostensibly you're carrying out a merger condition, actually the merger's well in the past now, and you're just telling something called, in that case, Constellation Energy, that it has to sell some power plants. And it's not really clear that the commission has the power. I don't, I don't know Maryland law, but let's say it's not really clear the commission has the power to tell utilities to sell power plants. Uh, and so if the court chooses to review it in that framework rather than as a, a merger condition, the, uh, the commission faces somewhat tougher sliding. That's what I was trying to get at earlier when I said that the dynamics of trying to protect the public interest in the context of merger review really shift if the process of defining and protecting the public interest doesn't start until the day that the truck backs up to the commission door and people start shoving out the boxes that constitute the, the merger application. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe. Um, it's, it seems to me that, that potentially, at least, there's a gray area uh, there. Um, that if the law, the law doesn't, the law is likely to say the commission shall apply a public interest standard. That it has, she'll find that the merger is in the public interest. Um, now, within limits, uh, that seems to allow for the commission to say this merger is not on the public interest as proposed, but would be if uh, the applicants owned a thousand megawatts less of base load generation or mid load generation, wherever the problem was, uh, than they do at present. Um, essentially, a, the setting of a condition, the finding that the public interest requires something somewhat different. Uh, and so if it's done as part of the merger approval, it seems to me you've got a fighting chance of achieving it, even though you couldn't, before that point in time, have ordered the two companies to sell generating plant. And if you wait two years and try to do it, you, you might well lose uh, in that context as well. But if uh, during that time when you're saying what it is that would be in the public interest, it seems to me, in, from my own experience in a lot, uh, and what I've seen in other states, you do have some leeway to say, well, what's proposed isn't, but it, uh, here, here's what would be. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think there is, and of course, 
the pattern will vary from state to state as to whether we're talking about the Attorney General's Office or the Office of Consumer Council or even the Public Utilities Commission staff. But usually there's someone uh, who's charged with representing the public in, uh, in PUC proceedings. And even as the commission has a basis here for rethinking its role um, in the context of antitrust, I think those consumer council offices or attorneys generals have the same kind of, of potential here. The Department of Justice promulgates merger guidelines primarily to avoid being in just this situation of coming in after the merger's been announced and, and trying to build the public interest case uh, at that point. As a matter of fairness to the applicant on the one hand and also effectiveness of their with regard to their concerns on the other, they want those concerns out on the table when the merger is being put together. It's, it's in everyone's interest. The, the review process can take less time then and, and fewer resources. The chances of, a, uh, of the merger being rejected at great expense and a lot of recrimination is, is reduced. Uh, and there's no reason why a state attorney general, a state attorney general, shouldn't look at uh, this issue similarly. And I would think not just as to electrics, but uh, as to telephone uh, um, and gas uh, gas mergers as well. You'd obviously have slightly different guidelines, but uh, the whole the whole process of Try, I mean, again, it comes back to looking at mergers as sort of a wild horse or something here. It's a force that's potentially benign if it's harnessed right, uh, and it's potentially uh, a real disaster if it, if it results in essentially unregulated monopoly conditions replacing monopoly conditions. And uh, the process of, of, of thinking through what it takes to get you into the benign channel and getting it out on the table early is one that's open to both commissions and, and consumer advocates. Um, one of the challenges probably in the end for the state legislature is with regard to competition, what role they want the commission itself to play, whether it's to function as a competition court or something more like a competition police force in, uh, in the future is a fairly, a fairly important judgment for, uh, for the legislature to make because as a competition court, um, it has a lot to offer. It has a level of expertise the state courts don't have. There are gonna be a lot of competition issues, uh, lawsuits, um, merger reviews that could clog up the state's regular courts. And so you, you, one can see a function somewhat like bankruptcy court, probate court, sort of a specialized utility competition court for at least a few years that the commission might play. But the alternative would be for the commission to be expected for, for the fair trade laws to apply to the utility industry in ways they haven't in the past, but for the commission to function more as a, a, a prosecutor who can proceed in the regular state court system. And that's, uh, I kind of prefer the former, but it's, it's a choice that the, the state legislature ought to make, uh, having thought about it somewhat, because it, it will make a, a substantial difference. Um, I didn't mean to suggest in response to your question earlier either, that the only types of conditions to be thinking about here are sort of mega conditions, uh, nuclear conditions, if you will, divestiture, uh, big bang um, kinds of things. There may be a number of, of subtler, smaller things that can be done, uh, um, or at least in if we're talking divestiture, it might not be divestiture of generation, it might be divestiture of the marketing function from the, uh, from the distribution wires if what the commission is concerned about is uh, the conditions of, of uh, local, um, local retail competition. Uh, so there are a lot of different options to, uh, uh, to be thinking about it. And the main, 
the main point is to avoid being in a situation where you have to be thinking about them when the merger's already headed 60 miles an hour uh, through the state capitol and through Wall Street, and, and, uh, and the commission's in the position of being vilified by everybody if, uh, if they slow it down. Um, the, uh, let's see, now I do have to knit this back together a little bit, but uh, let me talk a bit about um, the standards that the states do traditionally apply and some of the areas to be, to be wary of uh, in, in, in applying them because uh, the, uh, even in the area, even in the area to which states are accustomed to applying, that is, what are the rate impacts going to be? Uh, is this a good deal for the customers? Mergers are a somewhat different, requires a, a somewhat different type of attention. The typical merger seems to come in in a framework now in which the utilities propose to merge, they announce uh, a level of savings, um, and they propose a rate treatment with regard to those savings. Maybe it's a rate freeze, maybe it's an initial reduction. Uh, whatever it's called, it tends to fall into something of a, uh, a framework more like a performance-based regulatory plan than a uh, uh, traditional cost of service plan. And uh, the cynical explanation of that, of course, is that the utilities expect to achieve larger savings than uh, uh, then they'll have to, then they would have to flow through under the proposed freeze or the proposed plan. And the sharing formula in the performance-based regulatory plan is a way of keeping some savings that uh, under traditional cost of, cost of service regulation would flow through to the customers in, in the next rate case. Um, now, I'm not sure the cynics are entirely right about this, in part because the utilities haven't always been all that good at forecasting the savings. And so some of the conditions that they've taken on in some cases in order to, to obtain the approvals have turned out to pinch pretty hard as time has gone by and, and uh, the savings have, for one reason or another, eluded them. But here again, uh, a question of, uh, for, of foresight comes up that I think is of some importance. If the state requires that something close to a rate case be filed at the same time as or at least within a couple of months of a merger application, then at least you get out of this situation of having to set rates based on a fairly high level of generality, the, the, the type that often comes in in, uh, in a merger case. That is, very, very few of the merger cases that I've seen it, as a, lead to rates being set on the basis of a quality of data that a conventional rate case would require. And since what's usually being proposed is that rates or a rate formula be put into place that will not be changed for some period of time, three or four or five years into the future. And since fairly large sums of money are, are being uh, sort of pushed around in, in the context of the merger, uh, this really is a rate case of at least as much and maybe more significance than most of the rate cases that state commissions deal with in their, through their conventional processes. So it's somewhat eccentric to be setting these rates uh, on a basis really substantially more casual than the normal rate case would require. This was one of the problems I mentioned earlier with the, uh, the old FERC standards, the pre-1996 standards. They uh, tended to accept, they tended not to, uh, to do a rate case at all at the, at the time of the merger. And because FERC's wholesale rate setting practices have never been particularly aggressive uh, with regard to initiating cases, 
the result would often be that uh, utilities would, would be able to go forward with at least with substantial over earnings um, at the uh, at the wholesale level in, in the uh, early rounds of, of merger cases in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, it's also uh, important in reviewing and counting up the costs and benefits in a merger case not to count as benefits actions that you would expect the utility to achieve even without the merger. Um, put another way, it's reasonable to ask the utilities, the applicants, to evaluate whether the benefits that they are asserting would come from the merger can be achieved through other measures that would have lower costs associated with them. Um, the uh, um, For example, uh, if you take, say, the pattern of utility franchise boundaries that exists in New England or in places in the upper Midwest, it really looks as though it was the work of an inebriated Parker Brothers uh, puzzle designer in the 1930s. It's got nothing to do with economic efficiency or customer satisfaction, service quality. It was just the little town utilities that were put together by different utilities over time. Sometimes a utility owns a little chunk of territory 50 miles from anything else that it serves, just a little circle of territory in another utility's area. Um, now clearly, a merger has the potential to produce more efficient configurations of territory. Certainly, it would be true in upstate New York or New England. Uh, but is that the only way to do it? Does one have to accept the anti-competitive impacts that might conceivably come with the merger in order to get those territorial realignments? Couldn't the utilities just trade territory uh, in such a way that they came, each came out financially whole and both emerged with uh, basically a, more, a, a lower cost of service to reach approximately the same number of customers? Well, clearly, clearly they could. It doesn't necessarily mean that the merger shouldn't be approved, but it seems as though in counting up the benefits of the merger, the thing that the customers should be paying for, they shouldn't be paying for more than the lowest cost way to achieve any particular set of benefits. And so if you look at the merger side by side with some other way of achieving those territorial consolidations, and it turns out the merger Yes, it is achieving significant benefits. Maybe the benefits even exceed the merger's costs. But the merger's costs are twice the costs of getting the benefits another way. Uh, well, at least it's fair to ask whether that's a, uh, a merger that ought to be approved, or at least whether the costs of the merger are above and beyond the costs of getting the benefits another way ought to be passed through to the customers. So it seems as though an important part of merger analysis uh, includes looking at the utilities, the applicants' benefits column and asking whether those benefits are really being obtained according to what in the resource planning area we've come to call least cost principles. Um, the, uh, other areas that um, need to be evaluated as potential costs of the merger. Um, certainly uh, the loss of the potential competitor. Um, it, uh, it's not easy to, to put a price on that. But if, at least in the, in the, if you think about the boundary area between the two utilities who are merging, for each one, the greatest potential competitor at the retail level was almost certainly the other one because that would be the utility with whom the customers uh, of utility A would have the greatest 
familiarity in terms of a brand name. They would have seen the ads in their newspaper. They would have heard about it on the radio. Um, it would be perhaps not as familiar to them as their own utility, but, but the next best thing. It's going to have a much easier time establishing credibility as a retail marketer than uh, a utility from halfway across the country or than uh, Enron or someone who hasn't been in the electric business at all in the past. Um, so that, again, when the costs and benefits are being added up, it isn't just the dollars and cents. It's uh, the loss of a major potential competitor is, uh, is, is part of the problem as well. Uh, and again, the point isn't that you have to reject the merger. Um, but the point is that when, if you're trying to achieve a situation in which you're sure the customers are coming out of the merger better off than they would have been without it, you may want to use a, a you may want to seek a larger rate reduction to allow for a margin that covers these intangible costs as well. Another area to be alert to is that whenever a substantial corporate rearrangement is taking place in a regulated environment, there's a substantial likelihood that certain types of assets uh, uh, of a type that regulators don't necessarily normally pay a lot of attention to can disappear. And I don't mean anything nefarious by that, although having worked a fair amount lately in the former Soviet Union, uh, um, there is that concern too, but uh, in this case, I mean a, a more subtle process. And let me let me talk about it in the context of the breakup of AT and T. Um, at the time that uh, the divestiture order was entered, which I, if I remember rightly was 1982, to take effect in early 1984, uh, there was a. I'm going to use real rough numbers, because I don't remember them exactly. But let's say the total value of the Bell System pension assets was on the order of $36 billion. Uh, and the present value of the claims against those assets was on the order of $26 billion. So $10 billion in the pension fund uh, that was not likely to be needed to pay the claims of uh, the employees. Um, what AT&T proposed was to split that pro rata so that uh, if, uh, let's say, 60% of the employees were staying with the R box, 6 billion would stay with the R box, 4 billion would go off into the competitive world with AT&T. Um, and that, in fact, is what Judge Green accepted. Uh, the state of Maine argued that that was not the right result, that uh, the <clears throat> pension accounts had been built up at customer expense and that the full surplus ought to stay with the R box, that it was anti-competitive in any case for AT&T to go off to compete against MCI and Sprint in a condition in which it wasn't going to have to make any payments to its uh, pension fund for a long time because it was walking off with uh, a substantial <coughs> customer surplus. And that furthermore, if the burden had been the other way, if there were a deficit that needed to be made up, the argument would, in the Arbok funds, the argument would certainly be that that money uh, should come from the customers and, and it almost certainly ultimately would have had to. We didn't win in, uh, in that case, although uh, I've always felt that it was an issue that was simply too big for uh, the divestiture court to deal with. They did, we raised it rather late in the process, and uh, the judge's reason for rejecting it was, it was pretty cursory and not deeply analyzed. But I'd be real concerned in light of what's happened in the stock market in the last uh, a couple of years with regard to any merger which carried with it 
the proposal to set up unregulated companies uh, to get off into set up a holding company structure, get off into unregulated activities. I'd want to be sure that uh, excess pension funds, uh, the reserves for excess deferred taxes, um, that those kinds of accounts were looked at pretty carefully to be sure that the excesses stayed, I would think, with the, with the uh, monopoly customers. Um, if uh, for no other reason than competition inequality, uh, it doesn't make sense to send, say, the generating plants off to compete in a competitive generating market with no pension fund obligations for uh, many years or with a, a chunk of the excess deferred taxes that suddenly don't need to be refunded to, uh, to the customers. Um, and that's an area that I haven't seen attention paid to really in, uh, in any state uh, proceedings regarding mergers that, I, that I've looked at. Um, the uh, other area in terms of conventional review that I would pay some real attention to is the nature of the performance-based regulatory plan that, uh, that's being advocated. Um, the plans that are sometimes getting approved are being proposed in the nature of rate freezes. And of course, there is a fair amount of attention paid as to whether the earnings are likely to be excessive, what the sharings formula ought to be. And I don't mean to suggest that the freezes uh, are necessarily producing overly generous outcomes, but the merger really is a sort of once in a lifetime opportunity to push efficiencies uh, of a sort that conventional regulation doesn't through normal rate cases get at very well. Um, and there is a substantial range of choices. This falls more over into the area now of PBR than mergers, but since most mergers come with PBR proposals, it's worth talking for at least a moment about it. Uh, there is a sort of range of choices between uh, uh, PBR plans that have quite wide sharing formulas and fairly tough productivity factors, um, basically saying to the company, if you do real well, you can keep a lot, but you're going to have to work hard uh, to attain that, versus plans that, uh, in which the sharing kicks in uh, sooner the productivity factors are, are somewhat more gentle uh, and um, there isn't any one right answer and different commissions will have different tolerances for the trade-off between a smaller but surer rate reduction and a larger pressure toward efficient performance. All I'm flagging for you at this point is that that, that trade-off is really one that ought to be made consciously with some sense of, uh, of what the p possibilities are rather than uh, just saying I'll take it as to the, uh, the sure rate reduction. Um, and finally, it's a topic that's come up in a couple of mergers, not uh, not pervasively, but the issue of whether the merger has significant environmental impacts uh, is one that at least needs to be asked and examined. Environmental impacts could take two or three different forms, one of which would be whether uh, as a result of increased access to markets, as a result of the reconfigured patterns of ownership of transmission distribution, there was likely to be a significant change in the extent to which older and dirtier plants continued to run. Now, many mergers don't even raise that question. They don't have plants of that type uh, involved, but um, for those that do, it's worth asking. Second area of concern, what happens to the DSM and renewables commitments that one or the other of the merging utilities might have? Uh, will they be carried forward does it make a difference? Um, and finally, as transactions shift in their nature from retail to wholesale as a result of the new corporate form, 
does a state that cares about uh, resource planning, that has had an active IRP function in the past, lose the jurisdiction to uh, carry such resource planning forward? If so, what steps are necessary to preserve it? Is there some other way uh, to achieve the same goals? And is it possible to make sure that uh, that, that alternative path is implemented as part of the merger? Um, now, I, I want to come back at this point to the area that we've touched on before, uh, and that is the the techniques for making sure that the public interest is uh, is represented up front because that really seems to me to be the area in which I don't know this program can make the biggest difference that is uh, with regard to evaluating the merger in conventional terms um, There'll be people at the commission, uh, consultants that can be hired, who will come, who can come in and do a pretty good job of scrubbing the numbers, even looking at the competitive impacts. But that's, you know, that's with the horse is out of the barn by then. Uh, so the most, the most important thing it seems to me you can come away from this program thinking about is how to be sure that the issues that really matter to your commission the things that have been sort of rattling around in the back of the commissioners and the staff's head for years as, boy, it sure would be good if we could get a more efficient territorial realignment, get the nuclear plants into a different organizational framework uh, so that uh, they, they might operate more efficiently, um, create a, an independent, a genuinely independent ISO framework. Uh, that those kinds of ideas are put up front as part of the uh, thought process of utilities who are thinking of merging. Because when you think about it, it is not that hard for them to build some of those kinds of considerations in uh, if it's part of their merger discussion from the beginning. If, if the CEOs understand that, that this is part of the state's price tag, and in return for paying it, they have a reasonably high likelihood of approval in the state and a high likelihood of strong state support before FERC, that's worth a lot to them. Um, and these issues take on a completely different coloration if they're part of the utility's own planning process than if the utility has filed its merger application and then is confronted by a set of demands that it suddenly feels are uh, sort of like a gun to its head. If you want to do this, uh, then you've got to do all these things for us. And by the way, you've got to go back to Wall Street and renegotiate a lot of things. And you've got to call in all your lawyers and analysts and work them at great expense into the plan uh, in a semi-public uh, framework and context as the uh, merger review process goes on. So there's everything to be said for getting these issues on the table early, not least the fact that in formulating the policy statement, uh, the commission has the opportunity to use notice and comment type procedures to find out not only whether its own ideas of steps that might be desirable have merit, but also what else is out there, uh, what potential interveners might want to raise um, what the uh, public advocate community, the environmental community might want to raise, and to try to put those together into some kind of coherent framework uh, before it's in the position of having to, uh, to deal with um, a large merger. Well, what about the situation in which the states already had the large merger? Is it worth going through this, uh, this kind of exercise? You know, there's no one answer that fits all, but I suspect that the first merger for a lot of these companies isn't going to be the last one. Um, that uh, the next one may not be electric to electric, but that they're, that, that really uh, the industries are going to change in a lot of, uh, a lot of ways that will surprise us all um, in the next five or ten years. And, and that uh, 
having a set of merger guidelines, uh, even in a state that's already had a merger or two, is not going to be something that, uh, that will be superfluous. Now, I mentioned some time ago the main public service uh, case of a decade ago, and I will need to lay it out again now by, as sort of a warning uh, that there is another side to this seemingly sensible path that I'm urging on you. The main public service case came about in an odd way. It was, it's, uh, it was in roughly 1986, and Maine Public Service is the smallest of the three private <coughs> utilities of any size at all in the state of Maine. And at that time, it was the least popular and definitely the, the worst run. Uh, it was served just the northern half of the tip of Maine that sticks up into, into Canada. And as a result of problems in the construction of the Seabrook nuclear plant, all three of the state's utilities were in a fair amount of trouble. And as part of the larger cases that led them ultimately to sell off their shares in the Seabrook plant, they uh, entered into a number of different types of discussions with the commission staff and the public advocate. And the public advocate raised with Central Maine Power the prospect that they should take over Maine Public Service, essentially put it out of its misery, um, which at that time was substantial, including, as I say, the fact that all its customers heartily disliked it. And Central Maine Power Company agreed uh, to explore the possibility of, of such a merger. Maine Public Service essentially told them to go jump in the lake. Um, and the commission, in reviewing that set of events, put out an order that said, essentially, that Maine Public Service had a duty to at least evaluate whether that merger would lower the costs of, basically, its customers' costs of electricity. And we said that it was as imprudent uh, for a utility to reject a merger that was favorable to its customers as it would be for a utility to follow a more expensive course of purchasing generation or uh, signing fuel contracts, um, unless there was some good reason to do so. The main public service appealed that order, even though it didn't actually order them to do anything other than evaluate the merger and warn them that they needed to have a good justification for not pursuing it. And the Maine Supreme Court, in its wisdom, uh, held that in ordering the, the Maine Public Service to evaluate the merger and saying that it could be imprudent for them not to enter into it, the commission was, in essence, ordering them to merge in the event that it was the least cost solution. And since the court reasoned the commission lacked the power to order mergers, it therefore lacked the power to order utilities to evaluate mergers. Um, now, this, mind you, came in an era when it was the common practice of utilities to come to commissions on bended knee saying, please advise us as to the prudence of selling this nuclear plant, canceling this nuclear plant, signing this IPP contract. Uh, so we had thought we were operating in an environment, I mean, granted that Maine Public Service didn't like the advice they were getting, but in an environment in which uh, uh, we were essentially bending over backward to do something that most utilities were asking us to do anyway. But as a result of uh, that decision, the law in Maine at least now, is that the commission has no power to uh, nudge utilities toward desirable mergers or territorial realignments. And while I don't think it's a case that would be followed by, well, let me be blunt about it, any sensible court uh, um, anywhere else, it is certainly one that uh, you didn't, you're, the general counsels among you or those of you who have general counsels uh, available to you ought to be, ought to be aware of uh, in going down uh, the path toward trying to construct sort of uh, affirmative 
public benefits in uh, in the context of, of uh, creating um, creating affirmative merger guidelines. But we're pretty close to the end of the allotted time, and you've you've all been uh, real quiet for a long time. Is there are there questions? Yes. Um, um, you mentioned the jurisdictional gap between the states and the courts and the, the importance of the competitive issues for states. Um, in the, do you see that the, do you think the BGE Pepco case is generalizable? Where the, the analysis said on part of the court staff witness that the import capability into that area is about a third of the total load. So if, say, a third of the customer bought from some other other company, then two thirds of the load is has to be fully met by the local and utility the merged company. Now that company has full market power, it's almost a monopoly over two thirds of the market. It seems to me that, that that the physical layout there is generalizable to just about anyone in the country. So you have here you have retail market power with just about any horizontal merger generation. Um, I, I don't see how I mean it's good to do a sort of a careful analysis here and, and make sure all of that and see if there's any light and easy mitigation measures can solve the problem, but it seems to me that this is going to be a major problem with any sort of merger of that sort. Well, as to uh, uh, that sounds right to me, but especially because FERC has said that it isn't it's going, to, it's going to take a look at the retail yeah, market yeah. issues. Yeah. Yeah. There, that and then the commission said, well, this is something that the state should worry about. That's right. Uh, it, there, there's a pretty good piece in the current Electricity Journal, uh, for any of you who haven't seen it, by Richard Pierce, who's a law professor at American University, I think, anyway, one of the D.C. area law schools, that... Uh, really decries exactly that phenomenon and, and uh, uh, comes to the conclusion, as he puts it, against his better judgment that uh, Congress is going to need to get involved in this, that the, uh, um, there's a need to redraw the federal state line in such a way that the states <clears throat> may be left free to act, but basically get rid of the wholesale retail distinction and give the states jurisdiction over what's within the state borders, but that if it's interstate commerce, FERC uh, should take it on and should take it on aggressively. Um, it, uh, there's, there's no question, but what, you know, based on the merger experience in the airlines in the, in the mid-80s, that when an industry is restructured and open up to new competitive possibilities, you can get some very large disappointments by not paying attention to just this kind of issue. and. Uh, um, the only reason I'd hesitate to generalize is that I don't know how often you'll get exactly what seems to have happened here. That is, the two states filing a brief basically telling FERC, leave it to us. Um, and our DC hasn't acted yet, but then not doing much with it. Uh, it seems more likely you get one of two alternatives. The states saying leave it to us and then doing something. Uh, which I don't know why I say that. It may be to get exactly the, this pattern over and over again, but maybe not. Or alternatively, the state saying, for one reason or another, that uh, they would like for it to pay some attention. Um, if, uh, now, that's still going to be a problem for FERC because they don't have real jurisdiction over the retail, uh, I mean they, because they can't order retail competition. Um, uh, there's a fair question as to how far they can go in protecting that, which they're powerless to uh, to bring about. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, I think it is generalizable, and my guess is that at least that phrase that's in the Energy Policy Act of 1992 that keeps FERC away from doing anything it might be considered to be ordering retail competition is fairly likely to get revisited within the next two to four years. What, what will hold that back from happening is that as long as people insist that it be part of a grand federal restructuring bill, there could be enough arguments against doing that that it may just stay in limbo for forever. But if it, I think if it could be broken out and, and it could be focused on just that one issue, uh, 
uh, you'd probably get pretty broad consensus that there was a basis for changing. Yes. Well, there, there are probably now six or eight state cases in the last six or seven years. Tell me if I'm not responding, but uh, interpreting versions of the, of the broad public interest uh, standard. And let's see, the, the only one that I'm sure rejected the merger was uh, California on, uh, and they, actually their standard is it was somewhat more specific. They had the broad standard, but they also had an affirmative duty to look at competition, which some states do, and the environment, which most states I think don't in the context of, of mergers. And they found problems in all of those areas. Uh, um, but there have, there have been a fair number of other decisions in which commissions have put their own gloss on the, the public interest standard. Um, and all of them look at rates on the, you know, whether, whether the customer will be better off without the merger than with it. Most of them don't, though, look at it in the context of saying, and might they be better off still if, if some third course of action were, were followed. Uh, um, Oh. Well, you have to, it seems to me you'd have to have some gut sense of what the value was to the customers first uh, to decide wh whether you care whether the merger goes under or not. Because uh, if the merger itself doesn't seem desirable, uh, then you can push as at least as far as it takes to tip that balance uh, around. Um, you know, my my guess is that there is a literature, and I'm just not familiar with it. Uh, from the anti in, in antitrust parlance, in which courts have evaluated the value to the merged entities of not having to compete with each other. Uh, that, that kind of analysis almost has to have been done with regard to uh, a number of different types of mergers. And I'm also going to guess that you'll find, if you look at that, uh, that the value to the two entities of not having to compete with each other is generally pegged much higher than you'd expect. Uh, that uh, for two companies that have not been subjected to competitive pressures of any sort, to suddenly be looking at a world in which they may have to go head to head with each other and with, with other outsiders uh, with substantial built-in inefficiencies, not all of which are going to be all that easy to get rid of. The ability to set up a new structure that gets rid of their most feared competitor and makes and, and creates considerable barriers to any other competitor from further away is worth a whole lot. Uh, and that almost every dollar of what it's worth to them is a cost to the public uh, in the sense that, that, that if, if, if the merger didn't take place, uh, then the pressures of competition would, would, it, would reflect what the companies are seeing as a benefit as, as instead as savings to the public. Yes. Guidelines 
It might have been. Uh, I mean, in, in all candor, we were real, it was such an, at that time, mergers were something that uh, we had no recent history with in the electric industry. We had some in the water industry, some with troubles in small telephone companies. Uh, and um, so the development of guidelines would have been a, uh, a real challenge because uh, it, it would not have been, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been operating on any recent experience. Anything that had moved us away from appearing to order main public service to merge would, I think, have been made it more congenial to at least some of the, if I remember rightly, it was a split court anyway. Uh, so if, the gentler we were, the better our chances of having picked up, I think we'd have needed two more votes uh, uh, to have prevailed. Um, but I must say, it, what we thought we were doing was something not unlike what you're describing, except that it was all in the context of, of prudence rather than more generalized guidelines. We basically were just, we thought, saying, look, you can't just reject this merger because you don't want to do it. You have to evaluate uh, uh, what the customer benefit in it is before you turn it down. And I must say, to, to this day, that still sounds good to me. It, it, uh, um, you know, I can't say I'd go right back into Maine and do it again, but if I'd had the chance in New York, I wouldn't have hesitated. It, uh, um, The, the other interesting thing, just anecdotally, uh, for those of you who find yourself confronted by uh, hostile takeover situations, was that main public services customers who had vilified the utility for a decade, as soon as the possibility was raised that they might be taken over by this colossus from the south, central main power, which is about 135th in size of the nation's utilities uh, responded by rallying to their theretofore hated utility. And the polls basically showed within six months of this suggestion that main public services customers who strongly opposed uh, the takeover by, uh, by central main power. They didn't necessarily like their own utility a whole lot better, but they sure didn't want any change. And that's left me with the feeling that hostile takeovers in this business are going to be very hard to achieve. That the, that the dynamic that then sets itself up is that the local legislators uh, go into the, uh, during the legislative session and try to dream up all kinds of new impediments to, uh, to the takeover. And, uh, that the political processes in the state, especially if the taking over utility comes from out of state, are really going to be very tough to surmount. Um, I'd be interested in hearing if anybody's had any experience to the contrary on that. But uh, it was the, the turnaround in, in that part of Maine in terms of the threat of being taken over was so dramatic that uh, uh, my guess is uh, something like the, the proposal that's recently been made for the by uh, uh, to take over NYSEG by, hostily from out of state. Uh, I'll be real surprised if that works. Okay. Well, we're past the hour. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.